I'm so excited to be here as well. And I think when you speak at conferences, you never know what other people are going to say. So I think it's especially powerful when there's a lot of synergies between what people say in any given conference. And that's going to be very true today already. So I'm excited um, to be part of the amazing lineup that we have. And I also, you know, I think, you know, when you, when in my world where we work with artisans all over the world, I think um, we love partnering with museums because I think that when many people think of museums, they think of history, and I think that's really true. Um, but, but when we were seeing the slides that Pamela put together, there are still people making all of those goods all over the world, and so you can get inspiration from them, but you can also work with them and make with them, which is um, why there's gonna be a lot of, a lot of synergy with, with what Lori said, and I think you know, our mission is to help companies figure out how to do that. I think it's, it's never easy. It's actually really hard and complicated, and so how can we as a nonprofit have a cross-sector approach, working with philanthropists, working with organizations, working with governments, and working with brands to make that possible so that um, sourcing can continue and those producers can find livelihood in the market. I think you know, I, Nest is turning 10 years old, and 10 years ago, nobody spoke about artisans. They're not nearly like they do today. Now, artisan is used in everything. There's artisan cheese, there's artisan hotels, there's artisan everything it's talked about all the time. And so I think we spend a lot of time as an organization thinking through what does artisan actually mean. Lori had a great definition. This is my favorite, it's long. Um, but I love this definition from UNESCO and I love this for two reasons. One, I think people um, can become overly attached to the handmade and I think that is really important. But there's also parts of mechanization that are good and helpful. And so I think finding that balance between celebrating the handmade but also recognizing the importance of mechanization when it enhances and develops artists and producers and is important. And then I love the last part. I think craft in the world and what drew me to it originally was that it is one of the few things that's both utilitarian and aesthetic. There's a John Muir quote that says, everybody needs beauty as well as bread. But I think craft sort of encapsulates that. Historically, craft was clothing so that we stayed warm and we didn't actually perish. And, but it was also in those same prehistoric communities, women would spend an entire year making one garment or one blanket for their child or for their for their daughter when she was getting married. And so there was that combination of it both being incredibly utilitarian and practical, yet also a strive for being part of the beauty and for being part of the culture and the community and, and a unifying force in places, which I think is important. Homeworkers are artisans too. I think one of the, the things that I find most fascinating is that estimates vary. Craft is part of the informal sector, which means that most artisans all around the world are paid in cash and it's not regulated. And there are estimates that between 20 to 60% of current fashion production is happening outside the four-wall factory. So you, you hear a lot about ethical compliance. Rana Plaza was a horrible disaster in Bangladesh, and companies are trying very, very, very hard to understand their supply chains. Yet outside the factory, it's invisible. So the, you, the people will produce in a factory, think they understand the context of where they're producing, and then those same factories subcontract out work to embroiderers, to beaters, to women on sewing machines that are outside that factory. So really thinking about and expanding our vision of what artisans are. They're not always the basket producers underneath beautiful trees in Africa. They're also women in their homes in small cramped workshops doing beading and embroidery for some of today's biggest brands. And so making sure that those artisans are celebrated, visible, and supported is, is a big piece of our mission. They're women and mothers, I think. I'm in the nonprofit space, so I have to fundraise a lot. And, and I, Kraft is the second largest employer of women in emerging economies behind only agriculture. I think that there, we fight against a perception that craft is kitschy or um, something you pick up while you're traveling. It's, it's a huge employer of women worldwide. And research time and time again, and I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir, I'm sure everyone knows this, but when women are employed and able to work in their homes and provide for their families, it's how communities are strengthened. So it's, it's a place that needs investment and focus from, from the larger global community. Where do they fit into the fashion industry, which has been our struggle and, and, and journey for the last 10 years? The cultural divide. I think what, you know, what I think a lot of, we work with some home brands, we work largely with fashion companies, and I think what's been really interesting to see is while there's continual conversation, articles, photo essays on the beautiful handmade 
goods and hand weavers and beaters and embroiderers in Paris and the Italian leather craftsmen. And there's a lot of veneration for European makers. You have not seen that same support for emerging market makers, the same producers of beautiful silk, hand-woven silk in, in the corners of India. And um, so really trying to get, you know, Maxwell was speaking about the next generation. I think people see that, that the, the next generation wants to know where goods are coming from and, and realize that it's not just from that one kind of pocket. Um, so supporting and figuring out how to, to rise the next generation of producers. The rise of machines, I think. You can't talk about working with artisans and fashion without talking about the impact that mechanization has had on production. Um, not just production, but the design process. I think, you know, clearly the handmade is really hard to do in today's fast fashion calendar. It's, it's almost impossible. But I, and, well, and while that's destructive to handmade producers all around the world, it's also destructive to the, to the fashion industry, I think. I think it, it, they lack the ability to properly design into the techniques, into the goods that they're doing because they're, they're pressed up against such incredibly tight timelines. And so figuring out strategies for companies to be able to slow some of those processes down, I think is really important. And there's more and more companies trying to do that. And so, you know, Maxwell is also speaking about the kind of next generation. You see more and more smaller fashion companies trying to change that kind of strive to speed. I think the internet, you know, are the, the next millennials are interesting because while there is this kind of embrace of mobile and the fast and the tech, it's also seeing this huge rise in the slow. That's slow food and the local movement and you know, handmade production, people are trying to find balance in that world of speed. And so I think that you're simultaneously seeing both things happen in the changing course of design and, and in production. The big barriers. So, I mean, I think, you know, Lori is a great example of doing this well. I think many companies are afraid of working with artisans for, for many reasons. Um, these are the top, <laughs> to, you know, design, being able to properly interpret and work with techniques where artisan producers may or may not have an appreciation for an understanding of the global market. Shipping and logistics, working in far corners of the world proves challenging in many ways. Communication. Um, styles of communication, not just kind of access to the internet and, and other skills, quality control, artisans are in their homes. So um, you're talking about a decentralized supply chain. How can you do that and maintain the quality standards that are demanded of, of larger scale production? And then, you know, what I was speaking about, the risk mitigation. How do you work with people in their homes and feel confident that your producers are safe, that they're being treated ethically? There aren't very good systems right now to do that. Solutions. I think this is this is the more exciting part for us is that we we see all those challenges and we also see the huge opportunity. So we're excited about working with companies and foundations and philanthropists to try to find those solutions. How can we actually make this work? The first is investing in artisan development. I think you know our main mission as an organization is we're, we're one of the few artisan organizations that's entirely outside the supply chain. We don't sell product, we don't touch product. We're about elevating artisans so that they can navigate the marketplace on their own without depending on an intermediary. And so, how do you how do you make that initial investment, which we believe often has to happen philanthropically, into infrastructure, into business training and communication, so that they're able to manage and negotiate? business relationships independently for the future. As an example of that, we're working in uh, Varanasi in India, which I'm not sure if anyone's been there, but it's right on the Ganges River in, in India, which is, it's probably the most holy city in the eastern side of our globe. It's for Hindus who believe that they, they'll pilgrimage to Varanasi because they believe if you die and you're cremated and your ashes are thrown into the river, you escape reincarnation and you go straight to heaven. Buddhists believe that Buddha gave his first sermon on the banks of the river. So it is, it's, a whole, it's one of the most holy places people come there. And it's, it's powerful and it's visceral. And, and Lori was speaking about India. It's, it's very India in and, and, and all of those ways. It's also home to the largest, the oldest form of silk weaving. And there was at one point 100,000 weavers producing handwoven silk jacquard in Varanasi. China made a power loom that can replicate it fairly closely, and now it's down to one-tenth of that size, if that. So it's rapidly, rapidly disappearing. By, we've talked to many, many weaving experts, and they all believe that it would have died or is going to die within a decade if that trend is not reversed. So it's left communities completely devastated. We're working with two villages, one Hindu, one Muslim, about 
a stone's throw from each other. And when we first went in, and we were doing it in partnership with a luxury fashion company called Mayette, and when they started producing, there was a lot of quality control issues. And so that's usually when we get called in when there's problems. And so we went and did our first visit in Baranasi, and we realized that the weavers don't have quality control issues in terms of their production, but they're living in rural Varanasi, India. And so they have corrugated metal roofs and, as, and they're weaving in their homes. And so during monsoon season, which, which was also mentioned, the roofs would leak and the fabric would get dirty. There are dirt floors. Um, probably haven't seen, and I should have included, well, I guess you can kind of see, but a lot of the looms are called pit looms, and so you're actually sitting underground. So if you think about sitting underground and weaving when it's 130 degrees in the middle of summer, it's impossible, you can't. And so these weavers couldn't produce during monsoon season, during the summer months, and so they were stretching their meager income from nine months all year. They have on average eight to nine children, and they keep these looms in their homes, and so it was a real hardship. And so you know, my, uh, my first idea as sort of the naive Westerner was that we should invest in replacing all of the weavers' roofs. So, you know, like thousands of roofs. And luckily, our organization never makes our decisions on our own. And so we had focus groups with, with all of the weavers in many, many different varieties, women and men alone, and um, Hindus alone, and Muslims alone. And, and th what they all wanted uniformly was a centralized workspace. So those looms could come out of their homes. They had more room for their families. And I think you know, as an organization, we never advocate for people moving from their homes into a central workspace, because that can be challenging and culturally difficult. But I think um, in this particular case, it was what they really wanted. And, and I think weaving is my favorite form of craft because it's often done by men and women together. It's a family enterprise. So historically, all of the crafts that were done by women are, are two things. They're portable, so they're beading or embroidery that you can pick up and put down because you also have to cook and care for your children and maintain the family. And the crafts that are done by men are two things usually. They're either dangerous, woodworking, metalworking, things that involve equipment and machinery, or you have to be stationary and sit for long periods of time to do it, so like the actual form of weaving. When you see women weaving, they're often using portable looms. So like in Guatemala, you'll see it, and they're backstrap looms. You travel with them. You can fold them up and take them out again. But at an actual frame loom where you have to sit all day, historically all men. And so in, in silk jacquard weaving, which is a frame loom, the women do all the pre and post loom work. So they do all of the spinning of the thread, they set up the loom, and then the men sit and weave. And so it's, it, you can't do one without the other. And actually, the women's work takes more time than the actual weaving. But because they're not sitting at the, the loom actually weaving, they're often never paid for their part of the work because the men are seen as the weavers. And so it's not a formalized process for the women. And so they were incredibly excited to move into a facility where their work was recognized, valued, and properly paid for. And so, which obviously we advocate for as well. So when we started doing this project, and I should have included a photo I can... You can find it on our website, but we um, and we met the architect David Ajay, who designed the last museum on the National Mall, the Museum of African American History and Culture. He did the Oslo Peace Center, Alexander McQueen's home. He's a phenomenal architect, and, and he was taken by the project and traveled to Varanasi and sat under mango trees with the weavers, learned to weave, and helped design a building with their help. And so we're, we're building a, a David Ajay designed silk weaving facility in rural Varanasi as we speak. And I think the question came up time and again from some of our funders and some of our partners, why do that? You could build a, a cinder block facility for a fraction of the cost. And my response is that, that you could and you'd build a factory. And these are artists and they deserve a creative, beautiful workspace. And part of what we're trying to fight against as an organization is that these are skilled artisans. This isn't just labor, this is, this is hard work and it's art and, it's, and it should be properly valued and part of properly valuing it is understanding that those people deserve to have a beautiful workspace as well. So we're incredibly, this is one of the projects we're most excited about. Sourcing from artisans, I think, you know, the most obvious, so, so as a company you can invest in your supply chains, I think that's, that's important. Know your workers, know what their needs are, find solutions um, to making sure that their lives are, are safe, they're working in healthy conditions, and that they're paid fairly. Sourcing from artisans, I think the most successful partnerships that we've had you have to slow down the timelines. It's, we, we do do it. The, the silk weavers from, um, that I was just talking about showed on three Paris runways last, this past fall. They produced for The Row, for Mayette, and for an Australian brand called Kit X. And so they, they can make the timelines of, of the fashion industry, but it's hard, it's challenging. And the only way it works is when the brands are willing to invest in knowing their producers. They go on site visits, they understand the weaving process, 
and they learn the technique. I think we, you know, we see brands all the time that are excited about using artisans or ethical production and they don't learn the technique and so they'll send over patterns that are impossible to do on a loom and, and there's, a, there's a communication barrier that goes two ways. So I think brands often are, <laughs> it's easy to put it on the artisan that the, the, the communication challenges are on their end. It's also important as a brand to understand that it's also your responsibility to understand where you're working, who you're working with, the, the techniques and design into them appropriately. And respecting the makers as experts in their craft. I think, you know, I, I, I get a little sad because I think we're doing a project in rural Alabama working with textile producer, uh, manufacturing. So it's actually one of our projects where we're, we're working with machines, we're working with machine sewers. And in rural Alabama, in Florence, it used to be the t-shirt capital of the world. So they produced all of the t-shirts for the world. NAFTA was signed. And overnight, 75% of the town lost their jobs. Not just the factories, the dry cleaners, the, the restaurants, the grocery stores, everything. It's just, it was, it was blighted overnight because of that. And it, we decided a woman, and a very inspiring woman, wanted to help bring that back. And so she found one of the old factories with the machine still in it and set out to find the exact workers that worked in that factory and rehired them. And she started producing. She was lofty. And, and a lot of companies want to make in America. So she was working with Ralph Lauren and La Land of Nod, which is part of Crate and Barrel. And she couldn't produce for them. She lost thousands and thousands of dollars overnight because of quality control errors. And so she realized in 12 years, those, those sewers had lost their skills. And we tried to find a trainer to come in and train them without having to bring someone over from China. It took us 10 months to find somebody that was technically trained in sewing. No schools teach it anymore. They teach designers how to make tech packs and so you know, how to work with factories. And so people don't actually know how to make their goods. And I think that part of the challenge of that is that the millennial generation that's learning fashion and fashion production think they're talking to machines on the other end, not people. And even, even in machine manufacturing in China, someone's making it. And so it's really important to remember and to create a corporate culture where people are taught that even in machine production, the makers are experts. <laughs> so you can be a designer, you can be in production, and you can be an expert in your field too, but really embrace the, the other people as equals, I think is, is an important message. Some examples of, you know, that's the, the coat from the row, which was Varanasi, handwoven Varanasi silk. This is um, Say Cashmere, which is um, at Barney's, made in rural Swaziland. On the other side is the Elder Statesman, and it was handmade in Kenya. So it, you can see really amazing examples of, of production done right. I, can't, I have to, to make a, a small pitch for this because it's a room full of talented people. I think one of Nest's best programs, we run a professional fellowship program. So we have 250 artisan groups in our network. We can't possibly service that many in a year. But we also see this rising generation of people who want to know, it's the millennial conversation, but, but not just millennials, it's, it's everybody who want to know and work with and support artisans all over the place. And so we run a, a matchmaking program where we match individuals with skills that they want to, to share and use for good with artisan groups to do very short term, very defined projects. So um, anywhere from designing a website to product design collaborations to research, I mean, it, it spans the limit. 60% are done from their desktop, desktop computers while they're working, and 40% and actually travel to the location and do it. But, but a lot of them are done just via Skype and email exchanges, and it's been our best and most powerful and most successful program. And we kind of can't keep up with the demand, I think. While there is kind of a, a push towards ethical fashion, most companies are still just producing in, in big factories. And so I think that leaves their employees wanting more. And so it's been great and exciting to work with companies who embrace it. And we work with lots of companies that end up letting their employees have you know, three hours a month to dedicate to volunteering or have a travel fund for some of their employees that want to travel and go use their skills for good. So some examples of that. You know, the, the woman on the far left is Tina Robinson. She's the textile developer for Oscar de la Renta. And the girl next to her is, is a woman named Jen, and she's one of the designers at Ann Taylor Loft. And they both accrued all of their vacation days and spent two weeks in West Java um, creating a new modern collection of batiks so that our artisans could better compete in the marketplace. Um, but it speaks to, the, you know, they have very limited vacation days and they self-funded to go and use their skills to help the next, gener the next generation of craftspeople who we believe are in places like West Java raise their skill set. So it was really exciting in this picture. 
were working in Swaziland with basket makers, and we worked with an amazing woman who um, was, she just designed the last Eddie Borgo handbag collection and was at Rag and Bone before that, and she went and helped the basket weavers learn how to Im import their skill in basket weaving into handbag creation using leather, and then we brought her Italian leather craftsman who is in New Jersey and does all this sample making for most companies in, in New York City and taught all the women to incorporate the leather so that the entire process could be done in-house and that handbag collection is launching um, next month. So we're, we're, we're excited, but it, it, um, it shows the, you know, and I think Pamela was talking about this too, but it's, a, it's about, it's not about replicating or, or kind of producing what's already being produced. It's about helping elevate and bring that design inspiration so that it can become viable and successful and, and kind of long-term and, and, and continue to grow. That's benefits to brands. We kind of already spoke to Lori, kind of had a, a slide on this too, but I think it, we're, we're, ex, we're so excited to see companies excited to do it because there's so many benefits. I mean, we're, Pamela was talking about this as well, but bringing the human back, I think, is really important. We want to be working with integrity. We want to know our makers. And we want to know that they're ethically treated and, and the access to materials, to inspiration, the storytelling, the ability to put human, the human behind your work is, is something we really value. And I think consumers um, and the next generation of consumers are, are valuing too. The artisan side is it's it's tremendous. I mean, the the ability for women to work in their homes safely, to to see the reversal, uh, Varanasi silk, the investments where they was going to die within a decade, it had a more than 100 million media impressions in three months when we launched that project and was on three fashion runways. So really trying to see the revival and the return of some of these techniques. Poverty alleviation, our artisan groups, we're putting out our impact report, have an increase in 76% in revenue year over year. It's, it's really exciting to see, um, to see it actually work and bring business back. Slowing down, I think, I think it's important you know, that we if we, you know, as we embrace technology and speed and, and, and production, that we also find those ways to slow down and, and reconnect and, and make sure that um, we don't forget the human people and, and places in the process um, and finding that kind of deeper connection to, um, to what we're doing. That's it. Uh, any questions? <laughs> Any questions for Rebecca? Thanks, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. um, my question would be, at what point did you know this was going to be your mission in life? You're so <laughs> focused. Like, what was that moment? Sure. Um, so, as I mentioned, Nest is turning 10 next year, so I started Nest when I was 24, um, and I was straight out of graduate school. So, um, it, it, I studied social work, not fashion or production or um, anything, or business, and so it's been a, a learning. I loved talking about the meandering path, and I think that's so important in keeping organizations kind of small and nimble and being able to stay mission-focused, but know that things will evolve over time. But I, I didn't. I thought I was going to do direct practice social work. So all of my experience was working directly with women in therapeutic settings. And um, I, I loved craft. My grandmother was a quilter from rural North Carolina. And I grew up sewing. And, and she saw her sewing. And she made most of my clothes and my mom's clothes. And, um, and I felt that connection to, to craft and to makers. At the time that I graduated, Muhammad Yunus had just won the Nobel Peace Prize for microfinance. And I thought it was exciting, but it, but it was booming. I don't, probably don't follow social work in the way I do, but people started calling it a solution to poverty. And for me as a social worker who had just spent you know, all of my educational career, which is focused on individual change, not policy, not global policy, about helping individual people make successful choices, that seemed really frightening. In our country, taking out a loan isn't a business, it's debt. And so to, to say that debt was a solution to global poverty seemed a little bit scary because I didn't see organizations investing in holistic business development. It seemed more about kind of maximizing giving out loans and, and making a return on those loans. And so the, the original mission of Nest, and, the, and we've taken many forms over the years, but the, the original mission has remained, which was how do you create successful businesses? How do you empower people, not just through lending, but through actual business 
creation. And so I think I kind of that's been our kind of north star as we've meandered and found our our kind of slow, steady way um, over the last ten years. But I think once I found that and um, and saw the incredible uh, incredible skills, but also the reaction of consumers to good design and, and handmade production, I think um, it's been you can't. It, it, I forgot who said maybe it was Lori, but it, it, you can't. Once you're in this industry, you can't. You can never go back because it's it's the best. It's the best place to be. <laughs> Any more questions? Thank you, Rebecca. Uh -huh. We appreciate your time.